Good morning. Welcome everyone to this webinar on scalability and reliability in retail and e-commerce brought to you by Couchbase. I'm Karen Bowman. I'm the senior content producer for the e-commerce expo and technology for marketing shows. And I'm delighted to be joined by my three very distinguished and knowledgeable guests who I'll introduce shortly. Um, this morning, we're going to be discussing uh, everything to do with scalability and reliability and taking a look back at the past year in retail and e-commerce uh, and what coronavirus has really done in terms of pushing demand onto websites and how retailers have responded. Don't forget that you can ask any questions just by typing them into the Q&A box and we will come to your questions at the end of the session. So firstly, I'm delighted to be joined by Chris Bridgeland. Chris, you're the Senior Director of Solutions Engineering in EMEA for Couchbase, and you're heading up the engineering teams and services business uh, across Europe, Middle East and Africa, working with clients to deliver personalised customer and employee experiences. Um, so welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here as always. Great. And we've also got Janice. Welcome, Janice. Uh, Janice Thomas is e-commerce and marketing director at Look Fabulous Forever. Janice, you're an expert in driving digital marketing and delivering increased revenues and growth across e-commerce and subscription businesses. And Janice has worked with brands from Birchbox to Playboy and is now responsible for leading e-commerce at Look Fabulous Forever. So welcome, Janice. Thank you for having me. And last but certainly not least, we have Matthew Walsh. Uh, welcome, Matthew. Matthew is the Director of Data and Retail for IMRG, and he's responsible for all of the data and market reporting that IMRG publish, um, which includes the Retail Index, which is the largest and longest running e-commerce benchmarking tool in the UK. So welcome, Matthew. Thank you for joining us as well. Nice to be here. Thank you very much. So everyone, thank you for joining us. We're going to get into the discussion looking back at this last year in retail, which has been a, a bit of a roller coaster, I think, for, for retailers, uh, for supermarkets, for e-commerce businesses. Really what this has highlighted, the, the um, e-commerce platforms are no longer, have just having an e-commerce platform is no longer enough, sorry. You need to be able to handle extreme peaks in demand caused by unpredictable circumstances. And this has been the difference between survival or bankruptcy for some retailers. Database management has never been more important and is able to offer elasticity in how to provision capacity all year round. You need to be able to ensure stock control decisions can be proactively predicted and be able to handle surges. So we're going to review firstly the last 12 months in retail and e-commerce and then we'll talk about how to prepare for the unexpected uh, and some of the things to look out for, some of the common sort of pitfalls that some retailers have fallen into. So we've seen some really big spikes in web traffic. Obviously lockdowns and um, retail physical stores shutting has pushed most people online. And particularly I'm thinking, Chris, of supermarkets, um, Ocado, Sainsbury's, um, needing to really meet that huge demand that's been, that we've seen after lockdown down restrictions and everyone moving to online orders. Uh, we've also, of course, had Black Friday uh, and other sales, which have also pushed big, big spikes in traffic in orders. So, so Chris, if I can come on to you, Couchbase amongst your clients and you handle many different aspects um, from stock management right through to kind of storefront of the future for some of these brands. So can you talk a bit more about what you've seen in the past year and what are some of the things your clients are saying to you when it comes to uh, database management and provisioning? So um, I suppose the, the the one thing we've seen certainly in the in the marketplace today is uh, it, it's, it's obviously that everything has changed quite dramatically with regards to people's buying habits. And e-commerce now is, is the the way in which you can keep a presence and keep uh, activity with your, with your customer base. Um, so um, a lot of the retailers are, are looking at ways in, in which they can go and get much faster access to their data. Um, and you know, as much as we are a database company, we're sort of one of the new generation of database technologies that, that helps people get you know much faster um, in essence, analysis of, of uh, data usage, data trends, visibility of how their customers are buying, so that you can get make better business decisions as well. 
Um, we're also seeing a uh, significant amount of investment in artificial intelligence. So we've seen people go from just building a sort of a stocking algorithm and and relying on that as a, as a sort of a basis, but then put artificial intelligence over the top of that and see how people are using things differently. And obviously, no doubt, we'll come to sort of some of the things that Matthew's seeing in the marketplace as well. But, but in essence, being able to see that and react to that fast instead of waiting for, in essence, reports and, and, and trends, uh, again, data becomes a, a really core piece. So we've seen a lot of people um, you know, reaching out to us and starting to look at creative ways um, of, of, in essence, getting into, um, in essence, redesigning the way in which they, they, they work on things. We've seen also some struggles. I think uh, you know some of the retailers hit the hit the press just only uh, you know just when the the new lockdown came in around at Christmas time, when um, the the front end systems, the ones that are accepting people's requests to go and do their their browsing and 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 looking for things, where in essence um, you know some logic associated with you know somebody saying I I want my my groceries being delivered, the logic needed to be rethought about. Um, and, and I think that's where a lot of organizations are having to spend a, a good chunk of time, which is the logic on the old e-commerce systems or the old platforms. Does that make sense for today's model? So, for example, people want to know, could I get a reasonable time slot to go and get my delivery to my house for my perishable goods that I'm just about to place an order for? Or do I, or, or, or do I just carry on through the order and then get disappointed at the end? Um, and equally, does the front end system basically can it, can it handle the, the workload of people now going online? And so a lot of, at a technology level, we're seeing people now looking for that, that scalability, not just for the, 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 you know, the new Black Fridays and now the new black lockdowns, you know, in essence, sort of kicking in. And we're starting to see people sort of trying to react to those things much, much faster. So. Those are the sorts of things that we're getting involved in with with customers about how that. Brilliant, can... thank you. New black lockdown. I like that. Yeah. So so yeah, that's 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 really the the sort of some Brilliant. of the. Brilliant. Thank of the... you. Thanks. Great. Sorry, I think there might be a slight lag on the line. So sorry for any delay there. Uh, but Matthew, if I can come on to you, because you've got a very unique overview of lots of different retailers in the UK, because IMRG is the UK's online retail association. So you're really providing benchmarking across website and sales of, of hundreds of retailers. And that includes brands like ASOS, M&S, Boots, B&Q, and then uh, some much smaller kind of family run e-commerce businesses. So can you tell us a bit about what you've seen over the past year? It's been quite an unpredictable year really in e-commerce, but what are some of the key trends that you're seeing from, from some of those retailers that you work with? Uh, yeah, it's been crazy. Um, <laughs> just to give the background detail for anyone that isn't familiar with IMRG, um, we have a panel of about 150 retailers who give us their website sales figures. They actually hand over a little document that says, here's how much money we made on our website. Here's how many orders we got. Here's how many people visited our website. Uh, and it, it does come from companies like that you just listed there, like Marks and Spencer's and John Lewis and B&Q and Boots and New Look and ASOS. The list goes on. Um, and it's a very big sample. Um, if, if you were to total up all of the revenue that we collect from these retailers across a year, uh, it comes in at about 25 billion pounds of online spend in the UK. So it's a very representative sample of what is actually going on in the market in the UK. So to answer your question, uh, we've got a very good view of what's actually happened over the last 12 months in online commerce. And the biggest differentiator has been in whether that company happens to have high street stores or not so in the data that we have we can split it up and, and, and kind of divvy it out out in different ways and one thing we can do is look at this aggregated sales performance of retailers that happen to have high street stores against the aggregated sales performance of those that are pure play and if you were to look at a graph of how those two different sets performed across the space of a year uh, back in March and middle of March um, last year, when Boris Johnson got up and said, "Yeah, lockdown, game over, everybody. 
stores are closing, what happened was this ginormous shift of demand of people that would normally go onto the high street and shop with the brands that they know and love just went online. So you had companies um, just going from revenue growth of expected five, six, 10% in the month of March, shooting up to 70% up year on year uh, within the space of a week. And you have to be in a position, uh, as Chris can tell you about, being able to cope with that shift in demand. And so that's kind of been the biggest winner or loser that we've seen across 2020. The other one, uh, of course, is what product you are selling. So it didn't just come down to whether your format was pure play or multi-channel. Uh, it was also whether you happen to be selling clothes or not. <laughs> Clothing was the sector that got hit hardest over the last 12 months or nine months even, sorry. Um, overall, uh, in 2020, clothing grew just 1% online, 1% up in terms of monetary value spent. Whereas if you were to look at something like electricals, that was up 94% year on year. Uh, home and garden was up about 75% year on year. Health and beauty, 64% up year on year. It really was a tale of what are you selling and how is your product sold to people, stores or not? Um, so that that's kind of the biggest trend that, that, that we saw over the last nine or 10 months or so. Brilliant, thank you. And to come on to one of those sectors that you mentioned, which was health and beauty, I think you said it was up 64%. Um, so Janice, I'd like to, to bring you in at this point. Um, your background is a lot in kind of subscription-based services and you've got very wide ranging experience. So Birchbox is one of those uh, brands that you've worked with. And now you're with Look Fabulous Forever, um, which kind of falls under that um, health and beauty category. So can you tell me a bit about what you've been seeing on the e-commerce side uh, as the marketing and e-commerce director? Yeah, so as as Matthew touched on that, um, it's been very interesting for health and beauty, particularly beauty, which is my, my side of things, because all of those reasons you had to resist buying beauty online it's like oh I'm not sure what the color will look like oh I'm not sure what that product will actually feel like you know face cream or what have you you know suddenly being like well you can't shop like that anymore so you have to shop online even if it's just replenishment to start off with but then you start being a bit more adventurous because you just don't have that traditional option that you've always relied on and you find that it's probably easier and more convenient than you realize it for example one of the things that we do is we have um, a 30-day money-back guarantee that you can try any product and if it doesn't work for you we'll give you a full refund and you know try doing that under normal circumstances with boots it's like oh i tried this lipstick doesn't suit me it's like oh well what a shame um so i think that online experience and suddenly realizing that a thing that you were resistant to is actually easier um than you thought and particularly that my audience is predominantly women in their 60s and 70s and that older audience is one of the fastest growing markets in e-commerce because maybe they were resistant historically they've been forced to go down this route and discovered it is a better experience than than shopping in line online in store in many ways it's more reliable more convenient and all of those things so I, we've seen a lot of a lot of change um that are very positive trends that we think will continue because it's about getting people past that initial resistance initial hurdle that now we've done that i think there's no going back Brilliant. Thanks, Janice. So it's been pretty positive overall for you um, and your platform. Um, but Chris, if I can come back to you, I think not all of the e-commerce platforms, not all of the retailers have been as prepared. Maybe they haven't had uh, quite the positive experience that Janice has 
mentioned there. So what are some of these common pitfalls that you're finding happening again, that you're kind of advising um, some of those clients that you're working with? And what advice would you give to people dialing in today who are maybe also um, retailers or in, in health and beauty or other sectors? What kind of practical tips can you give? How can they best prepare to handle these, yeah. these big spikes that Matthew's mentioned as well? So I think I think a couple of things that sort of sort of kick in. Obviously, the business knows where the where the demand's coming from, and being able to sort of get into a point of predicting those is 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 going to be a dark art. It's going to be one of those things that uh, you will get better at the more people sort of touch uh, touch your systems or get access to your systems. But it's, but it's realizing those and then jumping on those and 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 trying to trying to work out where things are going well for you and need more demand. Uh, and where things need a little bit more, um, possibly either a, a business reshaping. So, for example, like Janice said about the 30-day money-back piece, is how do you attract people to come and use your, your platform with the knowledge that you're giving them comfort in their decisions, in the knowledge that, you know, hopefully there's a good tr amount of retention of the products that basically are, are kicking in. Um, so, so that's more on the business side of things. To deal with that, it's the it's it's like then also working out, and I'm I know I'm going to go a little bit deeper, but we're starting to see people looking at different ways of engaging with customers that help help make it more more relevant straight out the gate. So, for example, uh, for example, on the clothing side of things, if I want to go and push the clothing piece, instead of me having to go and select through, if I've logged in with my account and I'm a registered customer on a, on a, on a piece, we're starting to, to get um, a lot of our, uh, our, our clothing retail vendors starting to create those sort of like future storefronts, those virtual um, uh, dressing room type, type events where they can actually try on clothes in the knowledge that those clothes are equally in stock not just because they're, they're they're there but also giving them the opportunity to to turn around and say well what's in the shop it's like when you walk into a into a high street shop you want to know do you have my size in there if you don't then typically you're gonna you're gonna take a, a little bit of a walk out um you know relatively quickly but it's that sort of being able to be responsive to that so we've seen um you know now that and obviously you've got to be very sensitive around things like gdpr and all the other things like that but being able to turn around and say, right, what additional data do we want to capture on the customers to give them a much better in, engaging uh, uh, sort of experience? And so, you know, being able to store people's sizes, people people's preferences, um, being able to use buying history as a trend to, to basically analyze the things that they might be interested in. Um, those sorts of things start to become a lot more of the, that sort of triggering. So, we, as I say, we're, we're working with um, customers that are embracing artificial intelligence, they're embracing the, the machine learning approach to doing things. Um, and, and part of our job is we're, we're, a, we're a high performance engine to keep feeding that data so people can take different views of, of information and so that they can make, make decisions around that. Um, but then also there's that, that sizing aspect, being able to choose what platform you run it on. A lot of companies that have that have chosen the traditional physical data center deployments and not got ready for it. And we've seen the trends of customers can't actually get access to their data centers easily and they can't get physical shipments to the data centers are now sprinting fast to the cloud. So mm -hmm. cloud technology is now becoming a, a, a burst point for, for organizations, an opportunity for them to either take wholeheartedly a workload or an application set that they want to take out there because the cloud typically is already pre-built with a lot of capacity available to you. So we're seeing a lot of a lot of movement and a lot of direction where people are using this either as a, a necessity to move to the cloud because they physically can't you know, grow their current environment or they're using it as an opportunity because things are possibly even quieter to actually turn around and go, right, time to shut down the data center. We had it on our plans. Let's accelerate those plans and actually now start moving to the cloud. It means we can still keep our business going, but we can also start thinking about the business costs associated with maintaining sort of physical infrastructure and other things like that that we're seeing as well. But it, yeah, it, as I say, a lot of, a lot of people are, are looking at the technology has to help them. The technology has to be expandable at a, at a high rate and certainly cloud, unless you've got you know, equipment sitting in your data center ready, 
uh, which is which is obviously typically an asset or a cost that, that a lot of the companies are, are challenged with. And cloud is certainly a direction in which we're seeing a lot of our customers going and, and certainly an area where we are also expanding our, our focus as well. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and Janice, does that does that resonate with you? What Chris was talking about with um, cloud and AI, these sorts of technologies that you're looking at or already working with. What's your experience of those? Yeah, I think it's really um, really important from an ecom perspective. Is about experience and how do you make it as easy and friction free for the customer? So that's very much something that we've been working on that for example if you're a first time visitor to our website you know we offer a very niche product for a specific audience and our customers new customers want to know well why you know why are your products designed for older women what do they do why should i be interested and that narrative and our founder trisha cousin her story those kind of things are very important for new visitors whereas if you bought with us a load of times, you know who Tricia is, you know what we're about, you don't need that stuff you want to get into, right? Actually, I've bought, you know, lipstick and eyeshadow, you know, I'll be interested in a new shade of blusher or, you know, whatever it is and getting them to the, getting different customers to the different things that they need as quickly as possible. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and Matthew, if I can bring you in as well, because you've got that kind of overview from the many different retailers you work with. So some of the things that Janice mentioned there and, and Chris was referring to earlier, does, is that also coming through from the retailers that you work with? Yeah, very much so. The, the idea of making it as easy as possible seems to be the goal of everyone. Just allow the customer to find exactly what, find what they want as quickly as they want. And there's a, a, an often used metric internally with many of the retailers is the, the customer funnel. So it's kind of tracking the journey that a customers will take from arriving onto your site through to the actual completion of purchase. And at the top of that funnel, um, the two most commonly viewed metrics are of all the people that come to your website, how many of those will actually look at a product page and then how many of those will actually add something to their bag? And those are very good barometers to actually see how easy you are making it for customers to find what they want. And indeed, that they're pleased with all the information that you've given them and then put something in their basket. And for reference, we get told those stats, by the way, for the retailers that are in our panel. Uh, and for anyone watching, if you want to benchmark yourself, um, on average, uh, the the average website in the UK will see roughly about 60% of all sessions actually view a product page. Uh, and then of all those sessions that go onto a product page, about 19% on average will actually add something to their basket. So 60 will, will view a product page and then of the remaining lot, 19 will actually add something to their basket. So if you are way below those numbers, uh, that is a good a kind of alert that maybe something in your journey is not smooth is not right uh, go and have a look great very uh, that's a really great stat thanks uh, matt for that and chris you you were smiling and nodding during uh, as matt was giving those stats are you finding that uh, a lot of your customers are kind of in line with that does that Re reflect what you're hearing it it does and i'm, I'm, going, I'm going to give you yet a, yet another stat to sort of back up what what matt says too so when people go and have a look with this um we we work with one company which is obviously struggling at the moment with regards to the fact that it's travel industry but they have this mm. concept of a look to book ratio what they what they talk about is at a technical level how many fetches of data before somebody actually drops something in the basket sort of kicks in um, which means that therefore, when somebody clicks a button and says, I want to look for this feature, let's say, for example, to keep it on the travel industry piece, I want to go to Italy in June because hopefully everything will be allowed and I'll be able to travel and those sorts of things to kick in. But you've got no idea whereabouts in Italy. If you think about all the different locations that somewhere somebody like Amadeus has got, they've got all the different flight options, they've got all the different hotel options, they've got the, the whole country to basically pick from during that time frame, that one month time frame. 
Um, that's a lot of grabs of data for then people to go and do that sort of next fil the filter. Their stat is 800,000 to one is their looks a book ratio. So, so in other words, that, that fetch of data, 800,000 fetches of data for them to then make one final booking that basically sort of tie that in. So, you know, in essence, again, when you start getting into the giving people the options and the free form to basically deal with it, we get all excited, you know, and this is being a bit geeky and techy on this side of things, which is we're ready for that side of things because we know we can do that sort of stuff at scale, but we want to help plan that sort of activity with customers um, and with teams to basically say, don't surprise us because, you know, in essence, you know, oh, don't surprise yourself. We can help you get ready for these sorts of things as you get in there. So planning for those sorts of things of giving that sort of flexibility to users or bringing new product lines or, you know, extending what you're doing as a, as a service, just be aware of what impact does that potentially have in the logic, the technical logic that sort of sits behind that. So sorry to bring it down to a techie level, but yeah, that, that what Matt, Matt is saying that that you know it, it's the amount of fetches of data that we get. We have to translate that. How many people are hitting your site? But what are they looking at? And what does that mean on the back end for us to basically turn around and go? Are we giving them a almost immediate response, or are they having to wait for a significant period of time to go and get the data back? And the big wheel or the clock is turning on your screen, and you're going, okay, do I want to sit here and wait, or do I want to go and find another you know website to go and see if I can find that information? Mm -hmm. And that's also that that sort of like that that, that moment of clicking. That you start start thinking about how do I go and get that response going? No one wants to see that sort of wheel wheel of doom <laughs> or timeout or error anything like that. This is the thing: consumers now will probably not wait more than a couple of seconds before they do kind of click off and and look somewhere else or go elsewhere. And um, you know, the, you probably have some more kind of stats <laughs> around that, Chris or Matt. That um, you know that that speed and being able to access and fetch that data really quickly is is crucial. Is so I think what you're saying there. Yeah, absolutely. Great. And then if we can talk about one of the things you mentioned earlier, we started talking about this concept, the uh, storefront of the future. Um, and we we wanted to come back to that. So can you talk a bit more about uh, about that, Chris? That this concept of storefront of the future and how you're working. Um, maybe give a couple of examples of um, some clients that you're working with on that. Um, so yes, I, I suppose the, what we're starting to see is is um, is a, a little bit of a, a a change in how do we provide, in essence a really find a world-class experience and then make that experience usable for other other organizations. So, you know, we have companies that we work with um, such as PVH, you know, part of the, the parent company to the Tommy Hilfiger brand and, and others we've got um, uh, Louis Vuitton um, in, out, of, out of Paris again, doing a lot of stuff on online and looking at new ways in which they can, they can in essence engage with their, their customer base. A lot of the things that they're looking at is what additional, you know, for us at the data side of things is what are the additional ways in which they want to look at data and what type, what new types of data they want to be able to capture. Um, and so, you know, for, for, for example, being able to give somebody, um, and it, you, I think people have gone online and looked at some of, some of the, you know, the, the, sun, uh, the, the, the six pound glass companies, you know, get your pair, pair of spectacles for six pounds, but you can do the virtual try on and be able to get that side of things. But you want to do it with your face versus, you know, somebody somebody who's a, a model on the, on the screen. Being able to do those sort of things as virtually as possible so that you've got as good an experience as possible. The positive for that is that um, if you can give them as good as, as best, as, as, as I'm trying to make my English correct, if you can give them the best experience online, so that when they've made their decision and the, and the and, and everything arrives with them, the chances are they're going to they're going to stick with it, you know, rather than go and buy, you know, ask for five different versions of something and only possibly keep one. And it's the it's it's also the thing of of, of you know the companies trying to work out how do I make sure that when they've acquired they they bought something that they stick with it. And so we're starting to see how are we changing that. So the storefront of the future is is very much along the lines of what experiences can we give our, our our customers that basically give them much better experiences if they were virtually in the store and and give them that experience that says i've made the right choice versus actually i i bought five different 
sizes of this this top and i'm only going to keep one and send it back again you know that means that those other four weren't available to other people that also means that somebody had to pay you the logistics and yes they got free shipping because they bought five of them because they hit your your threshold but then you're sending them back again it's like people play the system because you've you've set the rules up so now what we want to do is play the system effectively Brilliant, thank you. And you talk, you touched on something that I know uh, Matt and um, the IMRG team are looking at around the, the logistics, returns, people ordering um, kind of more than they need. This is a big kind of sticking point, I guess, for the whole industry. Um, but as you touched on it there, I know returns is something particularly now with issues around returning things in and out of the, the EU um, that, that's only going to become more of a challenge um, I suppose, but Matt and Janice, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that to that point or around storefront of the future. Janice, well, I think the the returns piece. I think Matthew's much more qualified than I am to to talk about that. But in terms of the the storefront of the future, I think you know Chris is absolutely right. It is about how do you help people buy the right product, and this is something that we've been looking at a lot of different tech options on in the last few months and you know part of the problem that we we have particularly with our color makeup products is ar just doesn't work that it doesn't um the way color makes your skin look is to do with how it refracts light so trying on virtually doesn't have that that impact so we're going um down a more intelligent guided selling route that asks you about what colors you like to wear and whether you prefer gold or silver jewelry and those kind of things and then say as a result of those questions that you've answered we recommend these particular colors and and products and here's an example of how you would use those together so I've been into some store before kind of lockdown, some stores and some brands that, that we might know of that have been using this um, AR virtually try on this lipstick or this shade of makeup. But I have been maybe slightly sceptical with some of those things. I think perhaps it would work better with, with clothes or um, I know with some um, furniture uh, e-commerce platforms, you can see with AR what that piece of furniture might look like in your room so definitely some areas where it works well and other areas where you might have to be a, a bit more creative as you've said there Janice and think of other um solutions but Matt any other examples that you can pull in from anyone um any of the retailers you're working with um the 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 classic one that is the first example I ever saw of it was Ikea you can use their augmented reality app to essentially place a sofa or a chair or a table within your living room environment. It was very clever. But you have to remember that these solutions, they are very shiny and new and exciting. And it's quite easy to get lured in by this shiny new bit of tech when actually the rest of your website isn't getting the basics right. And as, as, Chris, as Chris said, if you can't serve up the basic results of show me a holiday in Italy in June quickly enough, but you can show that customer augmented reality dropped in front of the Colosseum in Rome, great. But <laughs> you need to get the basics right before you start playing with these shiny toys. What would you say to that, Chris? Is uh, what, What's the response to that? Is that becoming, is it a bit gimmicky? Is it something that you know, retailers can do both. They can get the basics right. They can deploy this latest tech and they can really serve up that full package. Um, so so I think I think one of the nice things that we've got is we, we because our technology um, is available in an open source thing, we we quite often get nicely surprised by developers coming up with really cool applications. But the but the thing is about it is is um, they've what they've that what they've gone and done by reaching out and, and using our, our technology in those sort of early so it's just like testing phases and testing stages is that they've also been looking for back to matt's point you know and my my point which is you want to make sure that you've got an engine that can feed you the data fast enough and can present it in a way that means that somebody is is impressed and carries on clicking versus stops clicking and goes somewhere else so, so absolutely, we, we, you know, we pride ourselves in um, in making sure that we give you know rapid speed of access to to people. I think most probably everybody on the audience here is most probably very familiar with something we all use, like LinkedIn, 
we're we're the engine that sits behind LinkedIn. Um, you know, the, you're, when you click and start searching for people or looking for certain things, you know, the the experience is great. But it, the way LinkedIn have written their application, the way they've written their website, um, and or their front end systems has made it really, really quite powerful. Um, but they rely on technology like us sitting behind it to basically feed that information in a in a in a in a way that satisfies you know their their sort of needs as you go through. So. So from from my side of things, it, it really is you know that that sort of you know making sure that you got the basics done right, you've chosen the right platforms for the workloads that you're going with, and you build in you know what what is your the, the next thing is what's your vision for if this goes well, what's the vision for the next you know where's your crystal ball moment next six months year or so so that you know that this actually can scale. Um, we've we've been pulled in with several customers in the in in. You know, in the in the recent history, where they've gone, we've got to move off this platform because it cannot scale. It cannot deal with the requirements that I need today, and therefore we're now being brought in because they're seeing us as a more viable solution for the for the current needs and also for the near future needs. Um, as I say, we you know, the Amadeus has we've grown with them as an example. We've grown with companies like Tesco's as an example with with some of the work that we do behind the scenes for them. Um, but a lot of it is their intelligence that they've they've basically built in, their logic, their intelligence, their algorithms, the artificial intelligence that they're, they are looking at to basically make sure that those things are going right and making sure that we we are a foundational element of their, their technology decision. Excellent. It might be a bit hard to, I mean, for some companies that may not be on the scale of, say, a Tesco to think, in that longer term way that you mentioned you know not what just what is it we need right now what might we need in six months 12 months two years um you know at some some companies might be quite bogged down in delivering um the here and now and being quite sort of responsive and, and reactive janice i don't know if you've got a uh, kind of thoughts on that and is it hard to balance that responding to immediately what's happening and hitting those kind of surges and then uh, thinking longer term at the same time I think Chris is absolutely right. That understanding your strategic objectives and where you want to be, like, you know, we all have tech providers and it's like, well, it's coming up to renewal. Well, should you renew, should you renew that? How long are you going to be locked in for? Chances are you can get a better deal if you can lock in for, you know, two, three, five years. But what do you know about your roadmap? And, you know, you know, for example, when I joined, our um, CRM provider was up for renewal. And it was like, well, I don't have time now to find a new CRM provider. But I know in terms of what I want to do from an automation and personalization um, point of view, that actually in about 18 months time, we will have reached the limit with our existing provider. And at that point, I want to start the process with a new provider. Therefore, I should renew with a two-year two term. But having to have that strategic view in terms of what I should be doing, because what I want to do later is coming along. That was a really important decision for me to make. So Chris is spot on. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, just want to remind everyone that's um, in the audience that you can ask questions. We'll have some time at the end. Um, we are coming up towards the last sort of five, 10 minutes of the webinar, but we will take questions at the end. So uh, please do type them into the Q&A box and we can ask uh, our very experienced panel here. So anything around issues you've had with scaling and um, perhaps you're a retail or e-commerce platform. Um, that's uh, experienced really big surges, spikes, uh, had issues around planning. So please feel free to drop any questions into the chat. Um, so just before we do wrap up, I'd like to come back to you all to sort of, we've reflected a bit on the last 12 months, how businesses have responded to lockdowns, to surges and spikes, and some good examples there of different retailers, some, some names that we've had. Um, so I'd like to know, in terms of predicting, I know nobody has got this kind of uh, crystal ball and it can be very difficult to predict um, even sort of week to week at the moment, but if you could uh, please share one or two predictions for what you think 2021 will hold in store for, uh, for retailers, for e-commerce platforms, and I'd like to go to you first, Matt, to put you on the spot and then um, ask for one or two predictions, please. Um. So each year, IMRG stand up in January in front of the press. And we, we organize a nice little event, event and we put a forecast out for what we think the coming 12 months is going to do for online retail. 
and we calculate it based on a load of science and mathematical numbers and we could try and look at macroeconomic factors to come up with a number that says here's what the industry is going to do and for the first time ever in 2021 we have not put out a forecast for this year simply because it's madness to try and come up with an actual number of what <laughs> the industry is going to do the one thing i can say is the next three months will be business as usual i say usual uh, it's going to be what you've seen over the past nine months the online retail is very very strong growth of 50 60 70 percent year on year but as soon as you hit mid-march uh, we will have had a full 12 months of kind of lockdown pandem pandemic situations and the growth figures that companies will be reporting internally and the growth figures that IMRG will be publishing to the market will start to look very weird. Uh, you've got a situation where the growth, let's say in April 2021, is going to have to grow on top of last year's April, which was colossal. So it, we may end up in a situation where companies internally are seeing themselves perhaps with negative growth. Perhaps they won't do as well as last year. But that's actually still not too bad because it's being compared to something that was astronomical the year before. So my prediction is people are going to have to kind of readjust what good looks like in terms of assessing their own performance beyond March. Uh, up until March, you can have a pretty good idea. But beyond that, it's anyone's guess as how the market is going to do. Interesting. Thank you, Matt. And Chris, uh, can I ask you for a prediction as well or any comments on what uh, Matt's just predicted there? April could be a turning point. <laughs> it's it's a it's it's a as as, as Matt says it's a, it's a crazy world. We we were we were really fearful that that things would go um, go in a direction when it all kicked off at the beginning of last year. And in fact, we possibly I, I don't think I've ever been any busier. So so having a, a in essence a thirty second commute to my cabin at the end of the garden is actually a a time saver. It means I can get on with my 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 daily work. Plus also you know I go change my profile picture because I'm. I'm obviously not following Janice's beauty regime at all <laughs> with regards to growing the beard, but you know I've got to got to deal with that. So, but uh, the one thing I would I would say is um, what we're seeing is there is definitely some some almost um, pauses while while organisations are realising they need to do something different is and and maybe my my guide is go look for the Hotel California products that you've got out there. What I mean by that is there are some contracts that you may be stuck with or you may need to take a very difficult conversation to the senior management or the board inside the company to say we need to go and do something different because some of these things are holding us back. Um, we've seen a lot of and and this is you know we, we've seen a you'll you'll find our technology you can you can find us in Google Cloud, you can find us in Azure, and you can find us in AWS, in Amazon. Um, if you're looking at cloud, we're seeing also a lot of retailers not wanting to give any money to Amazon, so they're looking for Azure or Google and, and other, other platforms because they're seen as a co-opetition or, comp or pure competition. So, um, so, so in essence, that's, that's sort of uh, moving on. I'm seeing a note coming through from Jacob as well, which is, which is sort of pertinent to some of the things, which is, um, you know, as you move to the cloud, it doesn't mean you have to go purely as a as a as a service. What you're in essence doing is taking infrastructure, and now you're going to need to get your teams, you know, operating more efficiently against that that new cloud piece. So, um, tech teams in house can. What we're starting to see is things that like cloud and other things like that are actually allowing your tech teams to become instead of reactive, much more proactive. And so we're seeing tech teams actually being much more creative now. Um, and don't don't stifle innovation. Even though we're not working together, we're seeing innovation being something that you you've got an opportunity to embrace it as best as possible. Because I think businesses are looking for those creative ideas right now. So so keep pushing that that side of things. And as I say, a lot of the a lot of the vendors that are out there today that that, that are sort of providing uh, technology platforms are doing it in a way that it complements you more so that's rather than you know gets rid of resources 
Um, it's it's actually helping you, you know, change it from an OPEX to a CAPEX or CAPEX to OPEX, you know, being able to understand what you're able to do there. And then in essence, coming up with in essence, things that are going to grow for the future. Excellent. Thank you very much, Chris. And then Janice, uh, lastly from you, any kind of uh, either tips or predictions, I, I suppose, for, for the year ahead? Yeah, I think um, like to combine some of the things that, that, that Chris and, and Matt said, that you know, we had this very unusual year where customers were their behavior was just disrupted and they were forced to find an alternative. And, you know, Matthew was talking about the multi-channel retailers and how they've been the big winners that, you know, you went from buying m and on the high street to buying m and online. And I think what it, the next year is going to be about is there were a lot of default decisions that got made like that. But the, the e-commerce businesses that can provide the best experience, that delightful experience that makes it easy and a joy to watch and can anticipate your needs they're the ones who are going to win long term and the e-commerce retailers really need to think about how are you going to evolve to meet your customers needs because if you don't then you might be the default for a certain period of time but ultimately someone else is going to eat your lunch Brilliant. Thanks. Thank you, Janice. So I want to save the last few minutes now to answer some questions that have come in. And I know that we touched briefly on um, the question from Jacob about retailers building out tech teams in-house versus outsourcing projects. So thank you, Chris, for touching on that. We can come back to that some more um, towards the end if we have time. But a question that we had in from Philippe, who's asking how you see e-commerce in Europe in 2021 uh, with the kind of backdrop of Brexit. So I don't know who might want to tackle that, but e-commerce in Europe in 2021 against the backdrop of Brexit. Perhaps Chris, if you want to, if I put you on the spot with that one. Well, you, you can put me on the spot of that one. I don't think I've got a, a, a wonderful answer. I suppose we, because we are, we're seeing, I think, um, in essence, the logistics aspect of getting uh, products in and out of, in and out of this country has already shown its to be a bit of a bit of a challenge and people are getting used to the new normal of uh, of the sort of border controls and other aspects associated with that one um but but in essence that that will always no doubt be a concern plus also any tax implications that uh, that, that no doubt are, are out there today and i i matthew you most probably got some some insight into some of that and janice i'm sure you have as well but the big thing for us is is um is 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 trying to basically make ourselves um valuable to help him make those sorts of decisions. I think the new business rules and the logistics. So for example, we've got some uh, large courier companies that work for us as well as some more localized ones like companies like Doddle here in the UK. There's a company called Doddle that uses our technology, but they're also seeing you know, the challenges of getting uh, in essence shipments of things to people in a meaningful time and meeting their sort of objectives and keeping people informed of that. Um, changing that sort of dynamic where people are actually being fed information instead of having to continue to check in on the where's my package type thing also kicks in as well. So we're seeing organizations sort of trying to change a little bit. The Brexit bit, as soon as you go across border, that's going to add complexity and just get you've got to understand what that implication is. Um, especially if you 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 know if you're in the retail world and it's um, um, dealing with the, uh, I suppose, the perishable world of, uh, of, of, <laughs> of goods that have a shelf life, then you've, you then you've really got to think twice about how how do you basically deal with that one and how do you either speed up or deal with the uh, the implications of, of, you know, things potentially not making it in time. So um, it's a challenge for businesses. I, I'm not going to say I'm going to profess to do anything, but we can certainly help people with visibility of those sorts of things so they know when those warning signs are kicking in. Great. And Matt, that's something you you are doing a bit of work on at the moment around Brexit. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. But again, as and when the customers are asking us for new ways in which we can build in things like eventing rules, like business triggers. So we, mm. we have part of our product set allows you to set a new business rule and then it will alert you when these things are basically getting close to you know, getting close to the discomfort for the business um, as, as well as you know, comfort for the business when things need to expire um, or things need to be triggered by the business to, to move forwards. Yeah. 
And um, and Matthew, uh, IMRG, you're doing a bit of a, a focus around Brexit at the moment, a bit of work around this topic. Is that right? We are, yes. Um, it's a funny one that uh, for a couple of years, we've been running lots of webinar sessions and roundtables with our retail member community. Uh, all are on all all these sessions are on Brexit, and it never really picked up that much traction or too much interest up until this month, uh, when all of a sudden, now that Brexit has happened and there are starting to be issues and paperwork problems, and it's actually in the lives of people, uh, it is all of a sudden at the forefront. Uh, I can't profess to be uh, a Brexit expert. Uh, in fact, if I gave you any advice, it would probably be mis misinformation. Uh, so I will probably just stay stum uh, on that one. But if you are interested, go check out the IMRG website. We've got lots of articles to read on on Brexit. Great. So we'll we'll move on from from the Brexit topic, unless Janice, there's anything you particularly want to to cover on that. We've had some other questions coming in. Um, so let's go uh, another question here from Ahmed, who's asking about um, B2B in e-commerce. So what, what's your kind of view of, of B2B uh, e-commerce in the coming year? I don't know who will maybe take that one. Chris again. Um, we're seeing a significant uptick actually in, in I would say, B2B um, because in essence, Companies can help each other out a little bit during these times. I think there's there's definitely some some synergies sort of kicking in. So take take Doddle. Doddle are now building relationships with other types of vendors. You, I mean, even you look at things like not not saying that we work with them, but you know, you look at Uber Eats and all the other things like that. They're they're trying to find ways of making making things come together to give that sort of end to end experience. So certainly a classic thing of retailers plus the the, the distributors and the logistics companies. That, that if a, if a retailer doesn't have their own, those sorts of things become a, a new way in which you can go and add add certain things. So, um, and and being able to therefore com communicate effectively between the two functions becomes a, an IT collaboration activity between the two organisations. Like, how do you feed an organisation that's going to take my my uh, shipments versus uh, versus the other way around, which is how do I get ready for you suddenly hitting me with a big, uh, you know, like the like the Black Friday situation. How does an organization like Doddle, if they sign up with somebody else, how do they suddenly get ready for a potential influx of of physical packages and things like that? They basically got to get somewhere. So I think B2B is definitely going to get in there because in essence, there are functions that will need to work together to give that end-to-end you know, experience to the to the consumers. So we're starting to see that sort of bridging activity now starting to happen. Brilliant, thank you. And I'll come back now to that question from Jacob Harvey, which we touched on about retailers building out their own tech teams in house versus outsourcing projects to digital vendors. And Janice, if we can come to you on that question, because I know you talked a bit about building out um, tech capabilities in house. So from your perspective. Um, if you can talk about how you've approached that building out tech team in-house versus outsourcing um, projects. Yeah, I think um, some of the stuff that Chris was was touching on, I think, is really important here because we don't we don't have tech in-house that I am the only tech person and I'm a marketeer by trade, um, essentially. Um, but I manage our outsource. But I think where we're moving to, and I think more and more companies are, is having tools that enable us as marketeers to control our website experience and what is on the website in a way that would have traditionally required developers to do that work. So I think those kind of tools that help you uh, tailor your customer's experience that is controlled from a marketing perspective. And I think that kind of line between e-commerce and marketing is increasingly blurred that particularly when you think about what Matthew was talking about, about that conversion funnel, it's like, where does that sit? You know, is it is it tech? Is it marketing? Is it um, commercial? And all of those things have to work together. And that's part of the reason that my role exists, because I sit across all of those things. So we don't have different people pu pulling us in different directions. Brilliant. Thank you. So we are pretty much um, out of time, unless there's any last questions coming in from the audience. I'd just like to ask for one 
key takeaway um, from each of you, please, just uh, either on the reflections of the last year, uh, a tip or prediction for the year ahead in retail and e-commerce, um, any last sort of pearls of wisdom to leave uh, our audience with today? So if I could go to you first, Chris. Um, so pearls of wisdom that I'm I'm certainly experiencing and, and been sharing with with a couple of uh, couple of other customers is um, keep that level of innovation and engagement with your teams high. Um, it is it is for some people some people love being solo and being being left alone to crack on with something, and some people need to need need that sort of uh, energy from other people and um, you know. Uh, use use of Zoom and other things like that is 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 one way of, of doing things or, or using platforms like we're using today, but um, but ultimately have a bit of fun. Um, too much it, the, the the fun is gone because you used to do that sort of stuff around the you know the water cooler in the coffee room or go out for a quick stroll at lunchtime and just natter about about anything. Um, take some time, uh, but also take some time to have some fun with innovation as well. We've been running sort of like uh, being a technology company. We call them hackathons. They're not quite hackathons. It's coming up with new concepts and ideas. Challenge yourself. Get get your own little hackathons going. Get if you if you're happy to reach out to technology companies to help sponsor those sorts of ideas and 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 and, and events as well, because those are you know those are moments in which you can actually come out with some really cool stuff because you got people that possibly aren't in your industry naturally in your industry coming up with new ideas or new concepts to to basically you know take it to the next step like have you thought about so so innovation i'm, I'm doing a lot of work with my team to keep the energy high keep the you know the fun level high as well but also using it as an opportunity to go and do you know brainstorming activities where we where we come up with new concepts new ideas and i'd i'd say we've actually changed quite a lot of internal things inside our organization during lockdown compared to what we had done in, in previous years where everybody was jumping in cars and on planes and trains and getting out and about um, where, where, you know, where we've, we've now actually got sort of these focus sessions which are working really well for us. So if, if we can help share those sorts of experiences with you where we add a bit of fun in with it as well, I'm happy to do that one with you too. I love that. Have fun, get creative, keep the innovation going and um, engage with your teams in different ways. I think that's something everyone can can really apply. Um, and, and Matt, to you, anything, any kind of predictions, tips or, or pieces of advice to our audience before we wrap up? Um, it, it's kind of in response to what happened during the sales performance during the pandemic that if your company is agile enough to be able to quickly pivot into new product categories, that will help you no end. So as I mentioned earlier, it was chalk and cheese between how well clothing did in comparison to home and garden or beauty. And there have been companies that have very successfully already started to migrate across from just selling clothing to dipping their toe into home and garden or into beauty that has fared them very well. So if your business structure and the people within it and the systems that you have are agile enough to be able to cope with a fairly sizable shift in your actual product offering, given that we don't know what's going to happen over the next nine, 12 months, if you are capable of being able to do that sort of dramatic shift, it will steed you well. That's brilliant. So uh, trying to be agile, trying to pivot. Uh, we've also had fun, innovation, get creative. I think these are things when you're really bogged down and particularly in the last 12 months or 10 months, it can be hard to um, to take that step back and think that way. But that's really great um, advice. And lastly, Janice, any any final words from you or um, predictions or tips for, for anyone in the 12 months to come? Yeah, I think building on what both Matt and Chris said that, you know, so many businesses said, you know, our roadmap accelerated, you know, a year, two years, five years beyond what we would have expected under normal circumstances. If you can keep that um, momentum going, imagine what you would achieve this year. 
Brilliant. Thank you. And that's a really nice, um, uh, positive way, I think, to end a, a positive note. Thank you all so much for joining me. Thank you to the audience for taking part. If anyone would like more information um, from, from Matt and I, IMRG, from Janice or from Chris, please feel free to reach out to them uh, on LinkedIn to connect with them for more information um, or to reach out with me. And you can also find more information on our website on the ecommerceexpo.co.uk website. So thank you again, Janice, Matt, Chris, for joining us. And thanks to our audience. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank thanks. You. Bye. Cheers. Bye.